Put on the screen, please, Psalm 133, and if you would turn to 2 Corinthians 5. We've been on the subject for some weeks now, and Sunday morning we're calling the Ministry of Reconciliation. Big part of the New Testament this is, even though you might not have used that term recently in a conversation. The Ministry of Reconciliation, or Reconciliation itself, is about having a relationship with the Almighty. And it's not just about relationship, it's about fellowship. These two are not the same. You can be related to somebody and have no fellowship with them. You can have a relationship, a legal relationship, but poor or no fellowship. Fellowship is the joy of relationship, good and full fellowship. Well, in Psalm 133, he said, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's a wonderful, good, and pleasant thing. But now uh, the opposite is true, too, how bad it is <laughs> to, to be in strife and have animosity and ill will, arguing, fighting. And there, how, how many know, don't raise a hand, but how many know there is a lot of fighting among Christians, church-going people, Christian families, Christian marriages. There is, whew, I mean, furniture breaking, dish throwing, cussing, hitting, among church-going people, folks don't like to acknowledge and admit it, but it's, it's been happening way too much. But when you can dwell together in unity, it's wonderful. He said, verse 2, it's like being in unity and having good fellowship. It's like the precious ointment or oil on the head that ran down the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garment. It's like the holy anointing, which is the presence of the Lord. Verse 3, like the dew of Ermon and the dew that descended from the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life evermore. Is there a connection between unity and anointing and blessing? Yes, there is. You can see places like the book of Acts where when they were all in one place, in one mind, one accord, suddenly, hallelujah, a powerful, amazing manifestation from God happened more than once. And you can begin to see why the enemy so incessantly uh, tries to cause and perpetuate strife and division because, in effect, it prevents the great manifestations of anointing and blessing. And you can begin to see why the New Testament command, not a suggestion. Anybody know what the, the New Testament commandment is? The New Testament commandment is Jesus said, love each other like I have loved you. It's not a suggestion. He didn't say try to do it. He didn't say do your best. He commanded us to do it, which helps us to see it's not based on a feeling. It's based on a decision. Amen. You love people because you decided to, not because you felt like it. Amen. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Man, if you base everything on feelings, <laughs> whoo, you're going to be an unstable individual. <laughs> <laughs> we don't live by feelings. We live by faith. Amen. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. Uh, look in 2 Corinthians, if you're there, 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, and the 17th verse. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away, that's inside. All things are become new, again, inside, with the inner man. Verse 18, 
All things are of God. That's inside. Who has what? Reconciled. Reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Now, if you're in harmony and unity with somebody, you don't need to be reconciled with them. You need to be reconciled. The only, only, reason, only way it would be applicable that you need to be reconciled to someone is that you guys are on the outs. Y'all have had a falling out. You're at odds with each other and need to be reconciled. Well, the Scripture tells us we were at odds with God. Oh, yeah. All of us. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Mankind was not okay with God at all. And the problem is mankind couldn't fix it. Couldn't fix it theirself. Couldn't attain to the purity and the righteousness and the perfection to be in fellowship with a perfectly holy, perfectly pure and right God. But he had a way, a way we could be reconciled to him. And it's by his son, Jesus, the Christ. He has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and he's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. Why? Because he laid them on Jesus. Jesus paid the price for them. So then God's not requiring that of us. And he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is not just something that you did mentally or that you have a certificate for it or you signed your name on a, a church membership roster and, and now that's it. No, uh, this is about relationship and fellowship, experiential fellowship. Being born again is not a mental Position. It's not a doctrinal position. It's a heart experience. The reason I say this, there's a lot of church going people who are not born again. Just because you were born into a Christian home and went to church for years, that does not make you a believer. Just because you recited a creed with somebody else. Jesus said, you must be born again. Born again is an experience of the heart. We just got through reading about it. Old things pass away. Things become new on the inside. Can anybody remember when you were born again? Yes. Huh? Yes, sir. I remember. I was a boy. My dad took us. We hadn't been going to church. My grandma took us to church, but my parents hadn't been going to church. And the Lord healed my little brother. My little brother that should have been dead. Should have died. And I mean we had a miracle. And my mom and dad wouldn't even go into church. My grandmother though. Was a prayer and a believer. But when we came home with my little brother. Who should have been dead. She called us to come see her. My grandmother. So we came. My mom, my dad, me, my little brother. And she said, my, my grandmother's soft-spoken, wonderful, dear woman. She's in heaven now for many years. I'm looking forward to seeing her again. Uh, she said, the Lord has healed our baby. We all knew it. Something had happened. And she said, I told him that if he had healed our baby, y'all would serve him. <laughs> Did I lie? <laughs> My dad hung his head. He said, no, ma'am. And that, that was Saturday. Sunday morning, we were in church. <laughs> and when the, the Baptist pastor 
gave the invitation for the altar call to get saved, my daddy got up and walked down the aisle and knelt and gave his heart to the Lord. And I so I thought my daddy hung the moon, and so I thought, well, if he needs to go, I probably need to go too. <laughs> so as a 13-year-old boy, I got up and followed him down the altar, and uh, I was changed. Well, you know, one of the things I noticed the next day when I went to school, what was this, junior high, I guess, was 13, whatever it was. Next day I went to school, the people I didn't like, they seemed okay now. <laughs> you know, this one I really didn't like. I'm really, I looked at them and I thought, well, they're okay. They are. <laughs> See, when you pass from life to death, the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. I was changed. I, I knew something was changed. I, I saw through different eyes. I'm reconciled to God. You might say, well, you're just a 13-year-old boy. I mean, uh, how could you be at odds with God? I was, because I had chosen uh, to ignore him. I had chosen wrong, just like you chose wrong at some point in your life. Everybody must be reconciled to God or remain separated from him. He's made the provision through Jesus that anybody and everybody can be yes. right with God. If you will. And as soon as you get right with God, now you got a new job. Hmm? You have now the ministry of helping anybody else get right with God. Just like you got right with God. And don't give us this I'm not a preacher stuff. This has got nothing to do with being a preacher. This has got to do with caring whether people go to heaven or hell. Right? That's right? And caring that what God has done for you, yes. that other people experience the same grace yes. and the same life yes. and same kindness. You don't have to quote a bunch of scriptures. You just have to be unashamed to testify about what he's done for you. Yes. You're an eyewitness. Yes. You were there. So uh, verse 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. Now, if they already were, everybody was already automatically reconciled to God, independently of what they do or don't do, there is no need for a ministry of reconciliation. There is no need to tell anybody or plead with anybody, get right with God, be reconciled to God, because they already are just based on what Jesus did. No, even though the Lord has done it, each individual still must believe it and receive it. It's a choice. And if you don't receive it, you're not right with God. Even though the price has been paid, you have refused to receive it. You have rejected it. And that is the most serious sin anybody can commit on the planet. Nobody's going to destruction. Nobody's going to hell beca only because they are a liar or a thief or a murderer or any terrible thing. The only sin that people go for is rejection of the master and his sacrifice and his lordship because he paid for all those sins. You might not forgive them, but he does. Hallelujah. Right. He does. So we've been reconciled by faith in him, and we have the ministry of reconciliation. Go with me, please, to the book of 1 John. We stopped there, I believe, last week looking at some things. There's so much about this in the first epistle of John, 1 John, just five brief chapters, and I encourage you to uh, look into this. Read 1 John again during these teachings. It, it doesn't take long at all. Uh, or, you know, um, there are apps that you can uh, put on your phone. It'll read it to you, right? Just focus and listen. I mean, there's a, 
It's so easy to do these days. But 1 John is amazing, like all the scriptures. But in what we're talking about, he's focusing, the Spirit of God through him is focusing specifically on this. Both our relationship and fellowship with God and with our brother, with each other. In 1 John, notice this, 1 John 2 and 8. 1 John 2, 8, he says again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you because the darkness is past and the true light now shines. Jesus is the light. Verse 9, he that says he's in the light. Now I need to, to, to re review just a little bit. Last week we talked about being in fellowship with him, chapter 1, 1 John 1, 1, and that chapter about how if you walk in darkness, you're not fellowshipping with the Lord. You're lying about it because if you're walking with him, you're walking in the light because he is light. In order to fellowship with darkness, you got to get away from light. You got to take a deviation from light. So he, this is the second chapter. So this flows from chapter 1 into this. He that says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loves his brother abides in the light and there's none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and knows not where he's going because that darkness has blinded his eyes. Now what you'll see in these chapters in 1 John is that our fellowship with God and our, our, our relationship and our fellowship and our communion with him is first of all based on our accepting what Jesus has done. And our faith in that, that allows us our union and fellowship with him. But we see also that how we treat each other affects our fellowship with him. And that first and foremost to be reconciled to God is that you acknowledge you need a savior. You can't save yourself and you accept what Jesus has done. You put faith in that. That gets you back with God. But if you treat your brother wrong, that interrupts your fellowship, not just with them, but with the Father. Doesn't mean you're lost. Doesn't mean he hates you. Doesn't mean he writes you off. But it's a, God's a person. He's a whole lot like us. Now, when you say that, people go, uh. well, are we made in his likeness and image? Yes. Yes. Are we a whole lot like him? Yes. Yes. Huh? Yes. Are we made in his likeness and image? Yes. Are we like him? Yes. Then he's got to be like us. You can't hold up two of these chairs and go, this chair is just like this chair, but this chair is nothing like this chair doesn't work. The fact that we have feelings and emotions and a lot of the things that we see the way we do, minus the perversions and distortions, is because He has them. God has what we would call emotions or feelings. He can be angry. He can be hurt, he can be sad, he can be mad, he can be glad, he sings. I'm quoting scriptures. How many would like a CD <laughs> of a few of God's favorites? And I mean, he's doing the vocals on the track. The Almighty. That's one of the things I'm looking forward to past this life. Can, can you imagine? Can you imagine millions of us around the throne 
And an angel says, shh, 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 the father's going to sing now. <laughs> Woo! You, you suppose he can hit some notes. Yes. <laughs> he invented notes. I reckon he could invent some new ones while he's singing. We, we got some amazing things ahead of us. But what I'm saying is that just like you, can your fellowship with somebody can be affected by how they treat your kids. He's that way. You're that way because he's that way. What if somebody wants to be your best friend? Loves you, loves you, loves you. Thank you, hung the moon and stars, but they treat your kid like dirt. Kick them when they're down. Hurt them. Are you okay? Yeah, but they like you. Huh? No, actually the opposite is true. Right? Even if they kind of slight you and don't pay much attention to you, if they save your child, you're their friend for life. Yes. Is that right? Yes. If they're there when your child needs them, yes. <laughs> they don't have to pay attention to you. Right. That's right. They made a friend forever. That's right. Well, the father's this way. And the thing is, he does love you. But he loves them just as much as he loves you. That's right? right? That's right. And if you treat them bad, He's not okay with that. That doesn't mean he says, you're no longer my child. You're lost. I'm taking your name out of the Lamb's Book of Life. No, 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 no. It just means you need to get it fixed. Right? right. You need to get it fixed with them, and then you need to talk to him about it. It can be fixed quickly, but you can't just treat other people like dirt and be okay with him. Go with me to uh, the New Testament here in um, Matthew 5, 21. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to an older generation, do not murder. Whoever murders will be subjected to judgment. Now we'll see if we have time in 1 John. He says, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. If you really do hate your brother and sister and you're okay with doing that, uh, your salvation's questionable. Have you really been born again? I'll get into some more detail in just a moment. He says, uh, I tell you that anyone who nurses anger against his brother will be subject to judgment. Whoever calls his brother, you good for nothing, will be brought before the Sanhedrin. Whoever says fool incurs the penalty of burning in the fire of Gehenna. So if you're offering your gift at the temple altar and you remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift where it is by the altar. Go make peace with your brother. Then come back and offer your gift. He says, with an offering, if you're at odds with people, get that fixed before you bring me that offering. Should we pay attention to that? Yes. Does it matter? Because people like to live in a fairy tale world. They, you know, they're just ugly as can be to people right and left. But then, oh, me and God, we're wonderful. Just me and you, you know. All these other folks, I hate them, but, but me and you, well, it doesn't work any more than people hate your kids and, are okay, and will be okay with you. It's such an issue that he says, don't bring me that offering when you're all messed up with them on that. Go get it fixed first, then bring me the offering. Do you remember that 1 Peter talks about husbands and wives treating each other well and right, respectfully and honorably, lest, or excuse me, that your prayers be not hindered. 
Well, your prayer is something between you and God. And oh man, this has happened so many times. Uh, husbands and wives have treated each other bad. But then imagine that they're just 100% with God. And, and, and just pray and pray and pray and pray. But if, if they were spiritual enough to realize, the Lord would say, wait a minute. I want to talk to you about your husband. What you just said and did. I want to talk to you about your wife. He doesn't hate you. He's not against you. But you can't just compartmentalize your life and say, I'm good with God no matter how I treat people. Amen. It's not reality. I don't know that I've ever said that exactly that way before. Anybody think it's right? It's true. And in Mark 11, one of our most favorite verses of all time, Mark 11, 23 and 24, actually begins in verse 22, right? And flows through verse 25. Look, look at 24, because if I read all of them, I'll get stirred up about faith. <laughs> he said, therefore I say to you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. That's between you and God, isn't it? That's me believing God for something I, I, I need or I want. Verse 25, and. Everybody say and. And. and Why are you standing there praying? Why are you standing there endeavoring to believe you receive what you desire? The Lord said, forgive. If you've got anything against anybody, forgive them that your Father also in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Verse 26, if you don't forgive your Father in heaven, neither will he forgive you your trespasses. Should we take this seriously? Yes. How we treat each other directly impacts our fellowship with the Father. You can't separate them. For one thing, you'd be ignoring the New Testament commandment. The. He gave us one. Love each other as I have loved you. Again, that is not based on any kind of feeling. It's a choice. It's a decision. You can treat people like you love them as a choice, as an act of faith. When you feel anything but that. We don't, walk, we don't walk by feelings. Faith is a choice. Love is a choice. To act on the command, I'm saying. Love is actually a person. But acting on the love command is a choice. Whew, thank you, Lord. Do you see this in the Scriptures? Is this man's idea or is this, this the Word of God? It is the Word of God. Go back to 1 John 3. 1 John 3. I'm telling you, this is the place to camp during this, this series. 1 John. It is so rich. Oh my, the amazing things that are, that are in here. The enemy's plan is deception, division, destruction. And it has been all too successful. He's a liar and a deceiver. He lies to you about me. He lies to you about God. He lies to you about yourself. Right? And while he's lying to you about me, he's lying to me about you. Can you see that? Deception. But now love is not quick to believe the worst about anybody. Right? It's kind of like what we were saying earlier about the climate change. You, when it comes to people, you need to be skeptical. You need to ask questions. Right? Somebody says, well, so and so, you know, they did this and that. Don't just go, oh, that's awful. I hate them. I no, don't want to be around them anymore. <laughs> Are they a brother? Are they a sister? Then you need to start saying, who said? 
How do you know? Right? Love is not quick to believe. And that'll help you, you know, from actually making a fool out of yourself. Jumping on the bandwagon of a lie and saying and doing things that's hurtful and harmful and find out later it wasn't even that way. Don't you look foolish now. Being spiritual means being slow to speak, slow to get angry. Is that right? And you don't judge. You ask questions. Did you hear about what happened to so-and-so? Did you hear what they did? Did you hear what that sorry, you know, person did? How do you know? Who told you? How do they know? Right? So many of these things are either uh, partially untrue or completely untrue. Have you seen this kind of stuff? And man, social media... That's why I stay off. Social media has just taken this to the next level, man. I mean, do you do understand just because it's posted doesn't make it so? Do you come on? Do you understand this? Yeah, but it's on the internet. <laughs> and it's got eight hundred thousand likes. Did you not know that there could be 800,000 confused people on the planet? There's more than that. It all starts one by one. One person had a dumb idea. Three more people liked it. <laughs> then their 12 friends liked what the three friends liked that never checked out, never, never examined anything. <laughs> people just hear stuff and just go, yeah, that's right. Were you there? Does anybody you know know anybody that was there? And as believers, we're commanded not to judge, even if they did do this terrible thing. For all you know, they've repented with God and are right with Him before you ever heard about it. He's not holding it against them. He's not even remembering it anymore. So why do you want to be spreading it all over the Internet? The Bible said, he that's of a faithful spirit conceals the matter. Faithful people don't talk. You can see why the Bible says faithful people are rare. They are. Truly faithful people, rare. But love is not quick to believe the worst. You, you got to, you know... Somebody's a friend of mine, somebody's a fellow believer, fellow minister. You want to tell me something bad about them? I, I, in, in the beginning, I'm going to act like I didn't even hear it. Where'd you get that? I don't know. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. And a whole lot of things, I'm not the judge. I don't have to deal with it. My job's to love you, pray for you. I want to see you do good, even if you did mess up. I want to see you recover. Right? I want to see, I, I don't want to be adding to your problems. <laughs> How do we get into that? The enemy seeks to deceive, lie and lie and lie and cause division so that there's fussing and animosity and, and anger and, and, and a lot of things said that shouldn't have been said, and a lot of things done that shouldn't have been done. And what's the result of that? Dividing. People divide and go, well, I'm done with you. And they say, well, that's fine by me. I'm done with you. So if these people were supposed to be joined together as part of the body of Christ and revelation and anointing were supposed to flow through them and they're supposed to be helping each other, that's not going to happen now. And the devil has been successful. So there's loss. There's stealing. And there's destruction. Can you see it? Deception. Division. Destruction. What did Jesus say? A house, a city divided against itself, it can't stand. He tries to do, the enemy tries to do this to every marriage, every family, 
every church, every nation. He, why? Because if we all get together on anything, it's done. I mean, all the enemy combined can't even slow us down. Unity and harmony is so powerful that in the early days when men got together apart from God and said, we're going to do this, and they were all one language, one focus, God himself had to come down and disrupt it because he said, they'll get it done. You talk about a powerful thing. Uh All of us getting on the same page. Right? Glory to God. (laughs) So you see why the enemy is just incessantly deceiving to divide, to destroy. Just keeping the strife thing going, going, going. Did you find 1 John? Look in the uh, third chapter. 1 John 3, 14. We know. Not think so, hope so. We know. We have passed from death unto life. How do we know it? Because we love the brethren. You don't love the brethren? You hadn't passed from life unto death. I mean, death unto life. You, you, you're not born again. It's like I'm saying as a 13-year-old boy going back to school on Monday morning. People had changed. All around me. Teachers, you know, that I maybe didn't care for as much. They're okay. People that had been ornery or obnoxious, you know, well, they're okay. I'm seeing through different eyes. The love of God has been shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost. Now, if you don't do the right things, you can, your heart can quickly get calloused and hardened from that just born again condition. And that's a bad thing. But you can get back to that tenderness and back to that awareness no matter how long you've been going with the Lord. You can get back to it. We, pass, we know we've passed from death unto life. How? Not because we can quote 50 scriptures. Not because we have perfect church attendance. How? The, the, real, the real indicator of a real Christian is someone who genuinely loves God, loves Jesus, and loves their Christian brothers, love fellow believers. He that doesn't love his brother abides or lives or stays in death. Verse 15, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. See, God doesn't just look at the action. He looks at the heart. And you can be a murderer and never pull the trigger. Right? It's about the heart. A lot of times people haven't done things just because they haven't had the opportunity. Or they haven't figured out how to get away with it yet. But it's in their heart. And in the right conditions, that's what they do. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Brother Hagen, uh, senior who's in heaven now, my father in the faith, he said, and this was back in the, I don't know, back in the 50s, I think, 40s or 50s. He was holding a meeting in a, in a church, and he's preaching on these verses right here. And during the course of it, he said, and of course he's a, He's a prophet, and he says things by the Spirit. And he, uh, he's quoting that, and he said, if, you're, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. And he said, and that means your mother-in-law too. <laughs> and he said some things, and he just went on. Well, at, uh, at lunch, he's eating with the pastor and, and the pastor's wife. And the pastor's wife says, uh, 
you've got me all confused. He said, no, dear. He said, I think you're confused before I got here. <laughs> and the ministry of the word has just brought it to life. <laughs> he said, but what, what are you confused about? She said, well, you said that uh, um, if you hate your brother, that includes your mother-in-law, that you're a murderer and don't have eternal life abiding in you. And Brother Hagin said, well, that's right. I didn't say it. The scripture said it. See, he said, what's your problem? She said, well, I, I hate my mother-in-law. <laughs> Well, that's, that's her husband's mother that's sitting right there beside her and the pastor's mother. She said, I, I hate my mother-in-law. He said, well, you, you're a murderer then and you don't have eternal life abiding in you. <laughs> How many understand? We, we need to put the scriptures first place. Not somebody's imaginations or even somebody's feelings. The word comes first. You don't have to be harsh and mean. He knew what he was doing. You'll, you'll see later on. She, she hung her head. and he said, She said, what are you trying to say? I'm, I'm not saved. He said, I, I'm not saying anything. The scripture's right. She said, well, what am I going to do? <laughs> he said, I saw she was on the ropes. But you know, you've you got to get to a place of being serious and acknowledging before anybody can help you. Playing games, you're not going to get help no matter who you're having lunch with. And he said, uh, look at me. Look me in the eyes. She's looking at him. He said, I want you to say it out loud. I hate my mother-in-law. She said, I do. I hate my mother-in-law. He said, now, he said, when you said that, was there something inside you that was kind of scratching at you about that? She said, well, yeah, I guess so. He said, you don't really hate your mother-in-law. That's your head. That's your feelings. The love of God's been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. See, she was... She was a believer, but she's letting her flesh dominate her. And she's just not, you know, not yielding to her spirit at all. So many times people's spirits have not been fed, have not been developed. Their spirit is so weak. And the flesh has just been yielded to until it is just in total control of the person's life. And their flesh is yelling and screaming and dominating. And down on the inside, their weak little spirit's going, no, don't, that's not right. No, don't do it. And, and the flesh says, shut up, shut up. We hate her. <laughs> but it's possible. It's possible to starve the flesh and to feed the spirit. Starve the flesh and stop yielding to it until that part gets weaker and weaker and weaker. Feed the spirit. Hallelujah. And exercise faith and love until your spirit gets so strong till you can say like Paul, I Keep my body under control. Amen. I bring it into subjection. Yeah. And so it's switched. Your flesh goes, I hate her. I hate her. You say, shut up. You don't hate anybody. You, I do what I tell you to do when I tell you to do. We love her. And your flesh goes, okay, okay. <laughs> we love her. God commanded us to love her. We're not just looking at the flesh and dumb things people have said and done. God loves her. That's his child. Right? If he can love her, I can love her. 
He even put the love in me to love her with. All I got to do is go with the program and agree with him and quit focusing on how I feel and what I've heard and what I've seen. It's a choice. It's a choice. He told the lady, he said, you, you don't hate your mother-in-law. Not in your heart. That's your flesh talking. That's your emotions. It's an unrenewed part of your mind. He said, Didn't, wasn't something kind of bothering you when you said that I hate my mother-in-law? And that's true. If you're really born again, you're really a child of God, you cannot hate people without it bothering you. If you can hate people and it doesn't bother you, you're not a Christian. I don't care how long you went to church. You've never been born again. These are not my ideas. If you hate your brother, at heart you're a murderer, the scripture said, and you don't have eternal life abiding in you. Now we've all said and done things we shouldn't have said and done, but if you paid attention, if you're a real Christian, your heart bothered you about it. Yeah, that's right. Huh? And the closer you are to God, the more it bothers you. And the stronger it bothers you. And if your heart's tender with the Lord and you're walking in good fellowship with Him, you just say a hard word to somebody. Man, it'll, it'll, it'll hit your heart. That's right. And you go, oh, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have said that. That's not right. You're not a murderer at heart. You're made in the likeness and image of God. You've got His own love shed abroad inside you, in your heart by the Holy Spirit. Now, we still all got flesh, and that flesh didn't get born again. You still got the part of your mind that's not yet renewed. You still got all these feelings and emotions. You can let that dominate you and act like an unsaved person. Or, or, we can let the greater one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah live big in us and influence our every word and action. Somebody say, I, I don't hate anybody. Well, the devil. <laughs> right? I do. I ain't going to shed one tear when he gets thrown into the lake of the fire. But people, we don't hate people. So many times people, even unsafe people, doing some of the horrendous things they do what did Jesus say when they nailed him to the cross? He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And they didn't. How could they have really realized who they're nailing to the cross? And they don't, don't know what they're doing. They're still doing it. But uh, many times we need to look up and say, Father, forgive them. They, they don't know what they're doing. And even though we may despise what they're doing, if God cares about them, we care about them. Hmm? There's a value there that we acknowledge. Keep reading in 1 John. Verse 16. 3, 3.16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Verse 20. If our heart condemn us, and we're talking about Fellowship and reconciliation. If our heart condemn us, isn't that what uh, Brother Hagin was trying to help this woman to see? Yes. When she was trying to say adamantly, I hate my mother-in-law, he's trying to help her see her heart is condemning her, bothering her for saying that. It's inconsistent with the love of God that's in her. Now this is not God condemning you. This is not the Holy Spirit condemning you. This is your own heart. Hmm? You're born again, new man, old things passed away, all things become new, the love of God shed abroad inside you. This is your own heart. But if your heart's condemning you, bothering you about it, don't you think God knows it too? He's greater than your heart. If your heart knows it's wrong, certainly your God knows he knows all things. Verse 21, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. 
And whatever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. This has got nothing to do with the Mosaic law, nothing to do with Old Testament commandments. This is New Testament. There's really just two things we need to be concerned with on a daily basis. Number one, believe in God. Number two, loving each other. But how many know it's a full-time job? Is that right? It's a full-time job. Not yielding to fear, staying in faith. Not yielding to worry, staying in faith. Huh? And not yielding to feelings, staying in love. It's a full-time job. Keep you occupied. Right? Man, if you're walking in faith, walking in love all the time, everywhere, with everybody, you ain't got time to judge nobody else. You right? You, you will be out of other people's business. <laughs> First John 4, 7, in closing, I think. But can you see if your heart is bothering you about something? Does that affect your fellowship with God? Yes. Yeah, it does. He's not against you. He's not holding your sin against you. You don't have to do some works to get back in his good graces. None of that. But don't get confused either that because Jesus has paid the price for all this, that if you walk in darkness and disobedience and, and yield to the flesh and hurt people right and left that everything's okay. You need to repent. Hmm? You need to repent and, and be reconciled to God and to them best, you, best you're able to. With God, you can always be reconciled 100%. With people, not always possible because it's not all up to you. We'll talk about that later. But when we are reconciled, we got no condemnation. And when your heart is not bothering you about how you're following the Lord or about how you're treating people, your faith comes right up to the top. You got full confidence. Hallelujah. To speak to things, to receive things. Get you, do you see? Did you see what he said? Whatever we ask, we get it. Did you see that? Whatever you ask, you get it. Why? Because your heart's not bothering you about anything. It's not getting in the way of your faith or your fellowship. 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not, what? Doesn't know God. For God is love. Hallelujah. So if we really do know God, and we really are walking in the light with Him, it'll show up how we treat each other. Huh? If you love God, the same fifth chapter says, you love the ones He begat. Right? Just like you. Somebody treat your kids good, you won't forget it. Right? <laughs> You treat, you do something for God's kids, he won't forget it. He won't forget it. Stand on your feet, everybody.